Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Muhi Khwaja with American Muslim Community Foundation, and today on the Muslim Philanthropy Podcast, we have with us Riyadh Shama, who is the Executive Director at the Institute of Youth Development and Excellence. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Riyadh. Alaikum salam salam. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and I really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Um, why don't you share a little bit like where you're located and kind of uh, your background for our listeners? Sure. I'm um, based in Cincinnati, Ohio. I uh, was uh, originally actually born here in Cincinnati, um, but uh, you know, my father is Egyptian, my mother is American, and I've been blessed to have an opportunity to live in a number of different places around the world, but Cincinnati has always been home, and that's where I've been back to now for 35 years. Wow. As, and um, I'm a fellow Midwesterner, so uh, born and raised in Detroit and, and lived there for uh, about until 2013. So oh, nice. been in the San Francisco Bay Area since, but always good to meet fellow Midwesterners, as long as they're not from Columbus or have anything right. to do with Columbus. <laughs> Um, so tell us a little bit, like, you know, what was it like growing up in, in Cincinnati, um, and just kind of having the multi-ethnic background and your American Muslim experience kind of growing up through your youth? Sure. So Cincinnati, I think maybe like a lot of the Midwestern states is actually a fairly nice place to grow up. Uh, it's relatively stable. Uh, it doesn't have some of the problems that big cities do in terms of crime and gangs and so forth. Um, so in that sense, it was a very kind of a nice place to, to grow up. Um, I was here until about first grade here in Cincinnati. We moved to Indianapolis for a couple of years. And then with my dad's work, we moved to Italy for one year uh, and then Saudi Arabia for five years. Wow. And then back to finish my last two years of high school uh, here in Cincinnati. And then since then here in Cincinnati. And for me, one of the the great things about that was having an opportunity to actually live in some other countries. And for me, that helped ground me in the sense that every place in the world has its good and its bad. In every country, people would say, oh, well, sure. you, know, you, like, you like living here the most, don't you? And I always had to say, you know, well, there are some great things about living here, wherever that was, but there's also great things about each of the other places. And so it gave me a very balanced perspective in terms of just that multi-ethnic view of the world of, you know what, every place, every culture has its good and its bad, has its problems and so forth. And so that helped, I think, ground me in a lot of different ways. And then in Saudi Arabia, because you're surrounded by the religion everywhere, when I came back to the States and there's no boundaries whatsoever, you can kind of do whatever you want. I had that crisis, I think, that a lot of my fellow students who came back to the States did, which is either you'll go to the, finally, I'm free and no more restrictions and I can do all this stuff that I imagined <laughs> I wanted to do. Or, and alhamdulillah, the route I ended up choosing was, if I don't watch my dean, I'm going to end up just being way off track. And I had friends sure. that I knew who came and, and took the party route and just ended up with their life as a mess. And then those that came and said, you know what, my dean is something serious. And out of that came a lot of the work that I then did uh, with Minna when it started up uh, in 85. Of course, yeah. And then that was the beginning, really, of my journey that ultimately led to, to IYDE. Nice. Um, and then, like, education-wise, um, where did you land after high school and kind of through um, your journey to starting IYDE? So with, you know, traditional foreign parents, of course, I went the route of engineering, um, you know, it's an Arab side. So I got a bachelor's evergreen in field and safe, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, did a bachelor's and master's in industrial engineering. And then that's kind of the, the focus that I had for a while. But I started a computer consulting company um, a few years after I graduated because the corporate work was getting in the way of my youth work. So I was doing a lot of volunteer youth work still. I was an advisor for MENA at that time, and we were running a lot of different camps, and those camps take a lot of time. And so I was needing to have at least multiple weeks off to be able to attend the camps. And then, of course, it's very time consuming the rest of the time as well. And so the 
corporate world didn't want to give me that time off. I said, I'll take it without pay. They said, it doesn't look good. You don't have that time recruit and so forth. So I started doing the computer consulting because that gave me the flexibility to then uh, continue doing the, the youth work at the pace that I wanted to, which was to be able to put in you know, a lot of time. So from there, things went into a number of decades with uh, MENA work and continuing to focus on developing uh, the youth and so on and so forth. But it came to a point where in any kind of consulting work, it takes a lot of extra time and, and effort. And it, it was really either I needed to focus on the consulting work to really make that business thrive and, and grow uh, or go into the youth work full time. And so I consulted with one of my mentors, uh, Muhammad, Hamid Majid, and he said, look, you have a skill at that. It's needed just trust in Allah and, and and take that path. And so alhamdulillah, I did back in 2007. I did uh, began the Institute of Youth Development and Excellence, started that full time to address the missing need. And that need that we found that was still missing was that element of mentorship. Because with MENA, sure. the goal was always to get the youth active and involved. But the idea was that they were going back to their communities and their communities would then nurture them, grow them, and continue to help them prosper. And the reality is that only happened for those very few that were in leadership positions. And the majority, unfortunately, didn't have that tremendous impact that we were hoping to have. And so we felt that IYDE was really that piece that would help bridge that gap, providing that mentorship for the youth to help them take those experiences, internalize them, and then grow with them. And then those times they were feeling perhaps less motivated, you had that mentor who had been working with you, who had that ongoing relationship with you, who lived in your community, to then continue to encourage you to stick to your dreams and the excitement that you had when you came back from camp or when you learned something and you were really psyched about it, to keep motivating you and keep you on that path of success. Right, because, you know, definitely influential programs that Minnow would offer and ISNA and MSA and, you know, but what's a weekend or a week in, in the grand scheme of things, right? So you can get that one um, idea or sense of what it's like to be in community with people. But then once you're back home, you fall back into your routines and everything like that. Um, and, and personally, like through the nineties and early two thousands, you know, definitely our family would go to ISNA. I would attend MINA programs, um, mm -hmm. in Michigan, we had a Michigan Muslim youth council, which really mirrored, you know, a lot of the Islamic educational retreats and programming. Um, and there would be some camps and our youth group in Canton, Michigan also did our own camps that we would go to annually. Um, so, you know, I definitely see the value in, in that mentorship and having that space for, for Muslim youth as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other piece of it too was making sure that all of our youth had positive adults in their life. You know, we always hope and pray, inshallah, that people have a good relationship with their parents. So that's, that's one. But it's not enough in the sense that everyone, at every age, we have things that we don't want to talk to our parents about. Uh, sure. You know, whether, they bring, whether they bring it up forever, whether it's embarrassing, whether we don't want to worry them, whether we're concerned that they overreact, whatever the case is. And so it's important that we have other positive adults in the lives of their youth. And as a parent, I want to know that if my children are going through something, that the people they're going to turn to to talk to about issues are people that I'm like, whew, okay, I'm glad. If they have to talk to someone, I'm glad they're talking to those people. Because there's a lot of people who yeah. are going to give a lot of bad garbage advice to our youth. And if we don't do our job in terms of making sure that our youth have those positive adults already in their lives, it's too late. If crisis happens, it's too late to say, oh, we'll go talk to so-and-so now. I don't know them. Why, why would I talk to them? And so that's that essence of mentorship. And it's the prophetic model. The Prophet would put people in people's lives so that they had those positive connections to talk to, to be open to people they could go to who wouldn't judge them, who they could say anything they needed to say and still get good counsel and, and be dealt with it with compassion and wisdom and understanding. Yeah, I think the whole idea of suhba and companionship and those people in your circle that you, you keep close um, is often overlooked. Um, but, you know, we, we know from the teachings of the prophet is like those that you keep 
will influence you right in your surroundings as well so keep good company is another adage that you know people often say and i think beyond kind of like religious mentorship you you know of course i had like a a halakha i was part of in high school and even some parts of college um and i have a lot of friends who are still you know they run their own halakhas around with groups of friends um but i've seen such value in mentorship beyond the religious circle as well, whether it's, you know, whether it was academically at the time when I was in college or uh, career wise, just being able to ask different people like, like yourself, you know, I was on the engineering track until my, my last second senior year. So I was in (laughs) college for like six years. Um, But, you know, I had to lean on people who uh, I trusted and sought their value and in their advice. And luckily, Alhamdulillah, I was able to, you know, chart a path towards uh, nonprofit leadership and development and fundraising. And, you know, it was because of those mentors that I found out about internship opportunities, or I found out about organizations uh, that needed help and volunteering and just getting a knack for that. So uh, I can definitely see the value in the mentorship that IYDE provides. Right. And the key thing, too, is that we provide mentor training. And that's critical because in study after study, they show that trained mentors are significantly more effective than untrained mentors. And a lot of times we have people that are willing to help. They just don't know how. And if you do it wrong, you can actually cause a lot of harm. And so this is why it's very critical to train people on how to be effective mentors. And that mentorship, by the way, does cover all of those things. It covers life skills, problem solving, opening your eyes to new visions of possibility for yourself, goal setting, conflict resolution, anger management, uh, emotional and social intelligence building, self-esteem building, all of these things which are critical to actually growing and being highly successful in every aspect of our lives. Uh, So not only the religious aspect, but absolutely our our work, our careers, our families. Uh, In fact, we encourage people to say, look, sign up and get trained, even if it's just to benefit your own children or to be a better co-worker, because these skills are really applicable across the board. Yeah. So um, take a little bit in terms of like, you know, you you sought your... um... Uh, advice from Imam Majid and he told you Mm -hmm. to, you know, jump into it. Talk to us about like what that transition was from not only going from the corporate world to being your own boss as a consultant, but then even switching from the consulting to this full time. And did you do both for a little while until it was self-sustainable? Like what was that um, route for you over the last uh, several years? Yeah, I, I definitely had to keep the consulting going, um, you know, initially because, of course, as you know, fundraising is always difficult. And, you know, it's one thing, you know, it's very, for me anyway, it's very easy to go out and, and do fundraising when I'm helping raise money to send kids to camp, right? I don't mind going up to anybody saying, look, MashaAllah, Allah has blessed you, brother, sister, you need to help sponsor two kids going to camp. You can afford it and it can be something life-changing for them. But when you're fundraising at yeah. the end of the day for your own salary, it's it's a lot more difficult um, because yeah, it is. It's just it's it's a lot more difficult to essentially try to fundraise for your own salary and toot your own horn and uh, and so forth. Uh, it's not my personality anyway to to do so. So yeah, uh, it certainly was very challenging. Of course, you definitely uh, learn and, and I learned this in the consulting as well. But you learn trusting in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and that Allah has the provision written. And so there are times where literally you had no idea where or how you were making, uh, you know, payroll or, or paying the bills for the next month and so forth. And then someone would come forward or a small grant opportunity would come in, you know, things like that. So that was definitely a very challenging thing. Alhamdulillah, you also just learn to depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know that if you do the work, and that's what I tell the youth all the time, your job is to do the work, let Allah take care of the results. Um, and at the end of the day, Allah's going to reward you for the work you do, whether or not you see the results. So just keep focusing on doing the good work and then don't worry about anything after that. Yeah. So, I, yeah. So that's been it. Yeah. I think anybody at a small nonprofit can relate, especially with like the payroll. And, you know, when when, when we fundraise for operations, let's say, 
um, whether that operations goes to programming or to uh, salaries. Um, you know, it's about reframing it because all of that is necessary for the end result of the mission, right? Right. So I think when those of us who are in uh, leadership roles at nonprofits that whether we're directly fundraising or just part of the team um, and we ask our friends to support our cause, it's it's more so about like, what is that end result as opposed to like, hey, <laughs> you know, I, I, I need to make ends meet. Uh, but I, I think if we reframe that discussion from the nonprofit side, in addition to the donor side, um, we'll, we'll see a lot of benefit because there's obviously the argument in a lot of spaces of um, administrative costs at nonprofit organizations, right? But if you can argue that if it is increased, you know, right now it might be 10%, but say if administrative costs were 20%, would that be such a bad thing? Right. And right. would it mean that you are able to um, expand your mission even further and accomplish more goals and develop more programs and see more output because you are able to um, have more staff or retain talented staff and so on and so right. forth. So I think there's a lot of uh, positives to that side of the discussion as well. Yeah, it really has bothered me actually that idea that people evaluate the effectiveness of a nonprofit solely based on this idea of well, what are your administrative costs precisely because of that. It really should be about, well, what are your outcomes? What are the results that you're bringing about? And let, let that speak for itself. Let the, the changes and impact in people's lives be that outcome that you're, you're looking to. And at the end of the day, for us, it becomes almost a labeling issue. It's like, okay, it's salary, but if I'm the one who's doing the program and so forth, and my staff members are the one who are out running the programs, well, that's where the time is spent. So in that sense, it's all program. We sure. spend very little time just sitting around filling out paperwork. I mean, there's a few things where you, you know, some mandatory paperwork we have to fill out. and But most of it's developing the program, running the program, evaluating the program. So it's essentially all program. And so we say, yeah, just look, look at our results. Look at our number of mentors that we're training. Look at the impact in the communities that we're having, uh, the number of youth that we have access to. Uh, because these are the things that are really bringing about uh, the most positive change. Exactly. Um, so why don't you share a little bit more about the different programs at IYDE? So our primary program is really the development and training of mentors. Now, initially, we started off with a focus of working directly with the Masajid or other communities that wanted to train a team of mentors. So, for example, we did this uh, with Adams when uh, Joshua Saddam was still their youth director. We went out. He had a team of 20 uh, volunteers who were going to be mentors. And then we trained their entire team of mentors over a series of weekends so that they would have an effective mentor program in place and then help monitor those mentors throughout the year just to make sure that everybody was staying on track and able to implement the skills and answer questions that might have come up as they came up. And then we also like to train a trainer within that community so they can continue to train additional mentors but there's always going to be some turnover, whether people leave for some reason, they get very busy, things happen. So it's always important to have more mentors that are being trained to expand the pool of mentors so you can expand the number of youth. So that was our flagship product, if you will, and the, and the main service that we were offering. Subsequently, we've also started now to offer through a platform, Why Transform, individual training for people who want to say, hey, I just want to become a mentor. I may not be with a, a given program, or maybe I'm volunteering at a, whether it's my mosque or big brother, big sister, or someplace else that uses mentors, but I would like to have the skills for myself on how to effectively engage and build other people. And so we have that track, somebody saying, yes, I want to be a mentor, and then we'll work with them, give them the training, support them through their mentorship process. Again, whether it's just for their message, for a a big brother, big sister program, or just their own family. You know, hey, I've got six younger nephews and nieces and I want to be a mentor for them. Great. I'm so happy that you want to invest in yourself and learn those skills. The third main program that we have is our children enrichment program. 
So our program director, Mary Martinez, had developed for us the Young Children's Program. So it's aimed ages four to 10. And that's a different perspective when it comes to nurturing and building those children. It's a matter of engaging the, the hand, the heart, and the mind so that they're connected both to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're actively involved, but they're also having fun and learning. So it's a comprehensive growth. And again, it's about building them to be upstanding individuals and to develop that cadre of skills and experiences on how to be a good friend, how to be active, how to learn, and how to have a zest for life and to enjoy coming to the mosque or wherever the program is. So that program is one that we run, for example, in Ramadan, uh, every night during Tarawih. So that way the parents can focus on their prayer. And then we run that program and engage the children. So the children are also benefiting and learning and growing during that time. And they have that month long experience as their parents are having that experience in Tarawih prayer. Uh, we've also done the program for Celebrate Mercy, for example. So during their weekend conferences on the Sira, the life of the prophet, we give a parallel program to the youth, to the children, the young children on connecting them at an age appropriate level again with activities and fun and all of those things so that they are suitably engaged at their level and benefiting in a way that makes them truly love that experience as well. So we really great. run those programs, but we also will do training for communities that would like to be able to run their own children enrichment programs as well so that they are able to grow their children, their young children from a young age to really love being there. And we don't have that, uh, negative Sunday school experience that uh, so many people are familiar with where the parents drag their kids kicking and screaming. And <laughs> as soon as the kids are old enough to rebel, you don't see them anymore uh, because it's just this tour for them to be there. It's not something that they love to do. Yeah. So we bring that love back to the hearts of the children. And so that's what the children enrichment program focuses on. So obviously over the last year, we, we've been dealing with COVID-19 and, the coronavirus, how has the pandemic affected um, your organization and the way that you guys function and operate? So the good and bad with everything. On the plus side, we were able to immediately transition into Zoom meetings. So all of the, the youth mentor meetings and our, our larger scale uh, youth mentor group came together and we, we did that on Zoom. So we have a weekly Zoom meeting now with everybody. Uh, we were able to add a, an extra halakha, a book club, a famous person's discussion group, and so forth, because you eliminate the problems of transportation. Now, any youth who come, it's not a matter of getting their parents another time to bring them, drive them, pick them up, and so forth. Now it's available for everybody to do. It also opened the doors for us to be able to work with more mentors. So now we have mentors in Columbus, mentors in uh, Salt Lake City, mentors in Chicago, mentors in Texas, you know, places that are able to now just zoom in and That's become great. mentors for and work with us because it's an equal footing. It's not anymore. Well, how come you get to see your mentor in person all the time? And I always only see mine on Zoom. Now we all see our mentors on Zoom. So it provides that level of equality for everybody. And it has helped us in that sense of really expanding that. On the downside, of course, the kids really do miss seeing each other in person. That That's definitely been a major challenge that there's Zoom burnout. There are online for school when school is in session they have other programs everyone's trying to put everything on zoom and they miss that face to face um, and i feel for them i do it's it's rough it's it's nice to see people we're social creatures but um you know we have to give priority to keeping people safe so you know we tell them you know hopefully once things calm down then we can go back to meeting in person uh, but until then we've just done most of our things on zoom that makes sense um, yeah, you know, in terms of, um, what's coming up for IYDE, what are some things that you're hoping to, uh, continue to do and also additional programs that you, you know, if you had the growth or the capacity, like where, where is the organization headed? So we have a, a couple of very exciting things. Uh, one is I was mentioning to you that we've started this Why Transform uh, mm -hmm. dot com where it's focused on really that individual training. So we're really going to be hopefully able to roll that out fully so that we can door for individuals to get the training for their own personal benefit, but then also, of course, 
we're going to be encouraging them to participate in their communities at whatever level so that they can be a positive force in the lives of their communities. And that will be applicable to anybody anywhere in the world. On the other side, uh, we are, and this is a, a funding issue uh, we have right now, but during 2020, we were contacted by the government, the, the Crime Prevention Department in Minas Gerais, uh, which is a state of Brazil. And they have had one of the highest crime rates uh, in the world, especially for teen on teen and violence against teens. So they had started five years ago, this program, uh, Fica Vivo, to start engaging the youth in positive activities. So they do a variety of sports, soccer, martial arts, and so forth. They teach them dance, graffiti, art, uh, cooking, hair cutting, styling, theater, makeup, all dance, uh, music, all these things to give them opportunities to engage in activities and so forth. So these 33 territories that they identified, they rolled the program out in, every one of those territories has 15 or 20 different adults that are working with the youth in those programs. And over the last five years, they've helped about 600,000 youth in their program. Wow. Luckily for us, the director of that program recognized the importance of mentoring. And so they reached out to us as a mentor training and asked us to do mentor training for their for the 100 managers who oversee those 33 territories. So we're gonna train them as trainers so that they in turn can train the 500 or so individuals that are working directly with the youth. And of course, those 500 individuals are working with anywhere from 10 to 30 youth a piece. So that should be around 10,000 youth in the first year. And the great thing is that all of their people are already paid staff there. So they have their people in place. It'll be a mandate, hey, this training is coming. This is a program we're rolling out. So they'll all participate in the training. And the youth, they already are engaging with the youth. So now it's just a matter of upping that engagement level so that the youth really have the benefit of mentors and not just someone who's running a program for them. And they have the statistics and the measurements of the last five years of the effectiveness. So we'll be able to take a look and say, OK, with this massive implementation of mentoring across the board, we saw this direct and immediate result, and this was a long-term result. And I'm really believing that we will see in the next 10 to 20 years, real transformation in those communities in Brazil that have these youth. And these are some of the shanty town areas, the favelas in Brazil, where it's just miserable living conditions. And I think we're gonna see something truly, truly transformative because we will be affecting so many youth in these areas that will be growing up with a very different vision of the world, of their possibilities, of themselves. And just believing that you can is so critical. Having that sense of self-esteem, that sense of worth, having that mentor to share the vision with you of possibilities, of helping you explore what's great about you. Forget what everyone else is saying, but let's talk and get to know you and let's see what's great about you because there's no prejudgment. I'm not saying it has to be this thing or that thing. We're all unique. We're all individuals. So what's great about you? Let's explore that. Let's see what possibilities the world could open up for you if you seize that amazing thing about yourself. And inshallah, it's going to be really, really wonderful. So that's hopefully inshallah, we'll be able to get the funding. We're going to be putting out a, a crowdfunding. Uh, of course, unfortunately, most uh, governments tend not to fund uh, these kind of programs very heavily. So at least they're already paying for that staff that's there. Uh, they're, they're not really able to put much in uh, to the additional training. So we're going to be doing outside funding uh, for that. But I think that's going to be a really transformative project. And then hopefully that becomes a model Then we can then share with other countries and say, look, this is the impact of this kind of work. If you roll things out on a large scale, you know, don't just go one small youth group at a time. But if you can say, great, let's give this as an offering across the board. Uh, I mean, imagine here if, if the state said, you know what? Yeah. Every program that wants a mentoring program, we're going to pay for you guys to have trained mentors so you guys can train mentors within your program. Take away that financial barrier because that's what it is for most people. Most organizations, not that they don't want to have their people trained, but we have to charge something. It's our full time work. And so that cost tends to be their limiting factor because they're also nonprofits. They also have very limited financial resources. And 
when it comes to the effectiveness of mentoring, it's not often that you get to see that immediate result. You know, when someone's starving to death, I can say, look, man, give me money. I'm going to buy food. See, I'm feeding him. Now he's full. You can see immediately that your donation for food fed somebody. Sure. But when I say, let me train this person to mentor them. And in 10 years, you're going to see they're a phenomenal person. And they're going to say, you know, it was because of my mentor. I don't have that future camera, unfortunately. Yeah. But in terms of just the um, transformability and the um, cross-cultural lens that your organization has, like, you know, starting out in Cincinnati, I'm sure you probably didn't imagine it would ripple across the world, right? But there's this sense of like, it's happening now and you've gotten to this point and, you know, you see the vision and potential of uh, something that just started out as, as something small. Well, in truth, my vision was always that every youth in the world would have access to a trained mentor. That has been my vision from the beginning. That's great. Because that's, I believe that's what we're called to do, to have a, a huge vision. And it may not happen in my lifetime. You know, I hope it does. But, you know, I also expect that that's an awful lot of, uh, mentors being trained to, to make that happen. But that's why I was actually very excited about Brazil because it's the first country that's really stepped up at a large scale and said, yeah, we're willing to do this because we want to make this change in the lives of our youth. And a lot of times people want to see it working somewhere else before they're willing to do it. Sure. Uh, ironically, in the U.S., we have so much research that talks about the benefit of mentoring. We still don't have a heavy scale government uh, support of it. Uh, I mean, there is some government support. I don't want to say nothing comes from the government for that. But you would think that with all of the research that shows the benefits of mentoring, there would be a much more significant. It would produce so much crime and so much problems in school and so forth. But um, anyway, maybe the new administration might uh, see things differently. We'll see. But oh. uh, yeah, new vision has always been there really for this to to happen. And and, and I hope that as, as donors see this, that they see this as an opportunity especially from that standpoint of Southern Clingeria to get in on a, on a ground floor level. You know, may Allah really bless all of our donors from the initial, from day one, who didn't have any product. I just said, look, you know, I've been doing the work, please, you know, we need this help at this level. And alhamdulillah, you know, we had a few who really stepped up and, and, and gave a consistent commitment. Uh, and we always, you know, pray for them because that was something that was, I mean, we wouldn't be here if they weren't there to get us even to this point. But now we need to really right. reach out and stop this. Uh, the same people can't always be funding things. And inshallah, once this gets going, we'll be in a position where we won't need donations anymore. And that's our ultimate goal. We don't want to be in a position where we need donations. We want to be financially independent. Uh, and that also from day one has been our goal. We really want to be financially independent. But inshallah, just another perhaps year or two uh, of uh, some significant donations. And inshallah, we can get to that point where we won't need to rely on donations. That's really exciting. And and kudos and hats off to, to you and your team for um, putting that vision to work and really seeing it through. Um, you know, obviously people can find out about your organization. The Instagram handle is IYDE online uh, and the website is IYDE.org. Um, I wanted to take a moment to also ask you just personally in terms of your own uh, zakat and sadaqa, what are a few organizations that you love to give to? Islamic Relief, definitely uh, at the top of my list. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I've personally known quite a few of the people in leadership, and they're one of the organizations that really puts boots to the ground. Uh, so I don't ever, I don't even look at their administrative costs because it, it's irrelevant, because they're doing the effective work and they are benefiting the people where the people need to be benefited and the times they need to be benefited and so forth. They're not constantly reinventing the wheel. They have things in place. Uh, it always bothers me when some crisis happens and 10 new nonprofits suddenly pop up. And it's like, what? if you have that time and effort, just give it to somebody who's already doing the work. Sure. And if you want to volunteer your time, then tell them, hey, I want to be a volunteer. Um, so... Islamic Relief, I think, has done just a phenomenal job uh, across the board. And you can give where you want. You can give to a particular country, to a particular type of cause, to a particular effort. So they give you a lot of ways of even customizing your giving. So 
I, they're my number one uh, recommendation when people want to you know, make that donation. Seeing that um, Islamic Relief was on your list, I, I want to mention the tie to kind of their influence and mentorship in, in me. Um, you know, our youth group every year would host a Islamic Relief uh, iftar or dinner throughout the year. Uh, and it was those events, those fundraising events that the youth would organize completely, right? And we would take care of all the logistics, get our parents and their friends together. Islamic Relief would send someone, usually Anwar or anybody else would come and fundraise. And uh, we got to learn about all those different causes that they supported. Um, and Islamic Relief being around for more than 25 years now, like it's just been that consistent and ingrained in the community. Um, so I think when it comes to like engaging the youth, now they have all of these young professionals who've had that experience over the last 25 years. Um, and they've just been doing a really phenomenal job as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd also have to say, uh, of course, you know, Minna is always, a uh, you know, so dear to my heart and, supporting especially getting kids to camp that can't afford to go so whether you're offering local scholarships uh, to encourage kids in your own community to attend um, or donating directly to them either way it's beneficial and and helping those programs continue to be there i think they're very critical for our muslim youth Uh, zaytuna.org also another great one because i think we have to invest in islamic scholarship and their again, one of the pioneers that are really helping things to happen at a significant and a consistent process and, and level and so forth. So so their work, I think, is absolutely critical. And then, of course, our, our, our local masajid. Uh, I think we have to give to our local masajid on an ongoing basis. Because um, it's, if, it, if we don't do it, then things tend to fall apart. And then our masajid can't run programs. They can't bring in programs uh, that would take train their mentors or <laughs> anything else because the massages are always feeling like, well, it's tough to get anything done and we have to make sure the building stays up. So if we're generous to our local massage, then that's going to help uh, make sure and let them know, say, hey, I want to give money, but I want to make sure that we have these kind of programs. I want to make sure that the people that are engaging with our youth are people who have training. You know, I think that's something that we need to be demanding. No matter what you're doing in the masjid, be trained on how to do it well. I mean, it's great that you're willing to volunteer, but do it with excellence, you know, and that means learn how to do it the best way. Definitely. Well, Riyadh, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Um, I guess the last thing would just be to ask those who are blessed with an ability to give to really look to the vision of, where things are going and what that long-term impact is. Uh, I know the, the the call for the immediate crisis is always going to be there and, and we have to give, but charity doesn't decrease wealth. And when you look at IYDE, really look at the long-term benefit of what's happening with those youth that are being helped over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years as they're developing families and they're continuing to grow and so forth. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, about your journey, about the organization. Um, and I really do hope people visit uh, IYDE.org to learn more. Um, and thank you so much, Riyadh. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.